Damn. This guy has a lot of shit I need. Hmm. He's all the way in the corner here. Maybe I can sneak his ass. Oh shit, he's armed. I gotta get out of here. Y'all ever played a game that just made you feel miserable? Not like the game is bad or miserable to play, more like the tone and what goes on is so dark and depressing that afterwards you're just like, damn, I gotta go watch some cartoons or something to lift my spirits. Well, this happened to me when I first stumbled upon this indie gem a while ago. What is that game? Well, let me introduce you to this war of mine. Brutal side-scrolling survival game by 11-Bit Studios. These guys are Polish devs more known for Frostpunk these days. However, this is the game that first put them on people's radars. And the reason is because at the time, there weren't many games that were doing what this game was doing. Hell, there still isn't. There's been plenty of games that have depicted the negative effects of war, but more often than not, the focus is on how psychologically damaging it is for the soldiers. This game is like, yeah, but what about all the civilians caught in the crossfire? Inspired by the Siege of Sarajevo, this war of mine looks at how fucked up it would be living through a situation like this. Entire neighborhoods in ruins, crime on the rise, barely any resources, which means perpetual starvation and depression, scraps are all of a sudden bartering items. This game paints a more vivid picture on how life is in a war zone better than many other games and all without a story really. The entire narrative is up to you. All you need to know as far as the premise is that a fictional city called Pogarin is under siege by some unnamed nation and you got a bunch of different characters from wildly different walks of life that have to survive under one household until there's an eventual ceasefire. And yeah, me describing how bleak this game is is almost redundant as just one look at it lets you know what type of vibe it's on. The art direction is strong here, black and white photos of real looking people, the shades of gray with its color palette, those charcoal like lines in the background that makes every frame look like a page in a storybook. That last one going back to the game emphasizing each run being its own story. Everything else has the game oozing with despair that the characters are probably feeling the whole time. And that's not even getting into the environment which, I mean, would y'all want to stay here? There's a surprising amount of detail in each room and it's not just the main house but every building and every other area too. Kind of surprised that this was able to run on phones, but maybe that's just me forgetting that phones are just mini computers these days. These are some big ass houses, man. I don't know if it's the side wide shot that's making everything look more spacious than it is or homes in Eastern Europe are actually like this. Either way, whatever the opposite of cozy is, that's what these places are. Not gonna lie, I got hella spooked when these photos started blinking. But going back to this wide angle side view for a minute, this was most likely implemented for practical reasons giving the player a clear view of the landscape. However, it does have the player feel somewhat disconnected with what's going on. Not saying that you can't empathize with what's going on, I'm just saying that this far away perspective puts the player not in the shoes of the characters, but more as this omnipresent observer seeing how things play out. It goes back to each run of this game feeling like its own story. The uniform grayness and the amount of clutter everywhere does fit this game thematically, but sometimes it does make navigating these environments confusing as hell. Like your characters can use platforms to jump to places, but sometimes you wouldn't even know because they blend into the background so much. Same with ramps and stairs. The UI also could have been a bit more clear too. Many actions share the same icons and this game loves to show a bunch of them at once which does overwhelm in the beginning. But nah, going back to the thick atmosphere, it's not just the visuals. As soon as you boot this up, you're greeted with this droning ambience that perfectly taps into that feeling of numbness after losing it all. The weepy guitar theme between days is a bit sappy, but all the other tracks are tight. It's strange, some of the songs are so creepy with their melodies that at times it feels like a horror game. I guess it does fit since this situation is pretty horrifying, but then within the same track, they start to sound triumphant. 
I guess mirroring the determination of the characters trying to survive despite the odds. But you know, aesthetics are one thing. Where the heaviness truly lies is with the gameplay. This war of mine is part survival game, part management game, and part roguelike. You got three to four characters in this badly damaged house that you have to keep alive day by day until the war stops, which can be up to 45 days. First, there's the day phase where you're practically playing The Sims. And in this phase, you're upgrading the house with useful tools and furniture while also keeping your people alive by feeding them, treating any illnesses, keeping their mood high, and staying warm. The night phase starts at 8 o'clock, and this is where you send one person out to different parts of the city to scavenge for supplies. There's a finite amount of resources in every part, and some parts are more dangerous than others with bandits lurking about, and you're on a time limit for how long you can stay there. If you don't escape the zone before 5, then your person has a really hard time getting back. So yeah, this War of Mine isn't that mechanically complicated if you played any other survival game. It's a pretty straightforward loop of crafting during the day and scavenging at night. However, what makes this game mega stressful and at the same time enticing is the scarcity, RNG, and constant moral dilemmas that this game throws at you. And in order to show you what I mean, let me break down one of my runs here. So my three survivors here are Pavle, a football player that's a fast runner, Bruno, a star chef that's a good cook, and Katya, a journalist that can get more out of trades. Weird combo here, right? This is essentially if Lionel Messi, Gordon Ramsay, and Lois Lane were forced to work together, but I can make it work. First things first, we gotta scour out our horrendous looking home here for supplies. We clear out some rubble, and there's some wooden parts that I immediately use to build some beds, improve the workshop, and make a radio so I stay tapped in on what's going on with the value of certain items. Pretty much every night in the first week, I raid this nearby cottage that has food, meds, and a bunch of building materials. However, it's still not enough to where I can build a stove yet, which means the gang will be eating raw food for a while, which isn't as satiating. After clearing out the cottage, I start raiding the nearby villas that actually have some inhabitants. To avoid any confrontation, I sneak through the basement and gather some food, which we desperately need. In the midst of all this, we're greeted by this stranger on day 4 that begs us to help his bleeding brother get home, which I oblige. For some reason, this whole week my base hasn't been raided, so one person gone shouldn't be too much of an issue. Second week and I'm still facing struggles with food. Pretty much everything we find immediately gets eaten the next day. My people have been perpetually hungry, but Pathway has been able to find just enough food day by day to where we aren't starving. There's more areas to explore now with a supermarket, sniper's junction, and a warehouse. However, they're all areas that are occupied by other scavengers in some way. The supermarket turned out to be a safe trip with the other armed scavengers being pretty passive. I thought I would find plenty of food, but weirdly enough, this place had a lot of weapons. The warehouse has a plethora of supplies, but was way too heavily guarded with bandits that all wanted the smoke. So I just scavenged the outside area and planned to come back later with some lockpicks and some more weapons. Most of the gains this week came from Sniper's Junction, where there's this sniper that picks off anyone that dare shows his face here. Had to use Pavlay's speed to get from cover to cover safely. I was able to reach the faraway building and open the hidden passage to reunite this man with his baby. I was rewarded with a crap ton of jewelry which will definitely come in handy later for trades. So the third week was rough. A crime wave started which means that our base was getting raided hard almost every night. Thankfully by this point I was able to board up the house and arm everyone with a melee weapon so nothing was getting taken. However Bruno and Katya were starting to face some serious injuries. One of the neighbors asked if we could help them board up their house which I reluctantly agreed to. Decided to have Pavle stay in this night to help Katya guard the house. She's already injured and her guarding the house by herself during a crime wave is not the move. Bruno returns but that motherfucker is getting sad as he's a smoker and we ran out of cigarettes a while ago. Withdrawals are getting to him but he'll live. 
I'm more concerned about him and Katya's severe wounds after all the raids. Ran out of bandages, which means that if we're gonna get right, we have to go to the hospital where they thankfully wrap you up for free if you're fucked up enough, but only if that character goes there. Day 18 and an old man named Anton shows up at our door to ask if he can shack up with us. Had to think about this for a moment because another mouth to feed does suck, especially since we've been struggling with food. However, with the crime wave taking a toll on both Bruno and Katya, another body to guard the base is needed. I let him in and was already disappointed to find out that his only skill was mathematics. Don't know how the fucking quadratic equation will help in this scenario, but welcome I guess. I already put him to use by sending him out to help our neighbors who are being stalked by some sketchy individuals. This is when I started to notice the differing morals of the crew here. Because Bruno's all like, yeah, fuck what they got going on, while Katya and Pavle are happy to help. So the crime wave has ended, but now the place is getting cold. Thankfully, I prepared a heater a while back and approved it to be more fuel efficient. But the cold air is the least of my worries this week as I've been hitting some roadblocks with the food and bandages. I attempted a stealth mission through the dangerous warehouse of Pavle again, and let's just say that he came out of that place with more holes in him. In order for this dude to not bite the dust, I had Katya resort to some pretty fucked up shit. Next night out, I send her out to this destroyed school where all the homeless are, and we rob these people for all they got right in front of them. They weren't having any of it, but I was armed with an axe and was able to fight them off and make my escape. Katya was pretty depressed about this the next day, but I had Anton reassure her. If there's one bright spot to this week, it's that our good deeds have rewarded us. The neighbor we helped protect came by and gave us a shotgun and some bullets as a thank you present. Would have been more helpful during the crime wave, but I ain't tripping. So it's officially winter and we have to burn through six fuel a day to keep things warm. I visit the church thinking that that nice old man Oleg is still there, only to be greeted by a bunch of armed bandits. I've been trying to avoid killing anyone else, but it can't be helped. These assholes have all the valuables in their building, and I don't really feel too bad about it since they did kill the residents of this building first. With the place cleared out, I come back here for multiple nights to get some easy materials, but it looks like all the stealing is taking a toll on Pavle as he becomes depressed. Dude has shown himself to be the most sensitive of my group here. I built an animal trap to alleviate the food shortage in the future. I wouldn't say that the house is looking cozy, but it definitely feels more homey now than it did in day one. So things are pretty stable at the house for the most part, but I'm running out of materials to scavenge for on the outside. I go to the local brothel for the first time that's been occupied by some thugs, and feeling cocky after the last fight at the church, I try to rob the front trader. And yeah, I pay the price substantially. See, as you can see, the more you fuck around, the more you're going to find out. With my main scavenger dead, Katya now has to slide into that role. The others are obviously sad about this turn of events, but they're taking it way better than I thought. I guess this past month has really hardened them. I've been avoiding going to the quiet house way up north for all this time because the other areas just offered way more, but with all the other areas drying up, I guess I have no choice but to pay it a visit. It's occupied by an old couple with a wife that's sick as hell. It's crazy that they've lasted this long, but unfortunately their good fortune has ended. I take most of what they got right in front of them, and I gotta say I felt pretty shitty about this in real life. So did my household in game, but we gotta do what we gotta do. If there's any good news this week, it's that the peace does seem to be coming to an end soon. And on the 42nd day, it does. Anton is scarred for life, Bruno was internally sad over his friend, and Katya couldn't reunite with her folks. Even though the peace has come, it seems like everyone has come out of the situation worse. And this playthrough was one of my more successful ones. So yeah, as you can see from all this, this game is pretty damn stressful despite its straightforward gameplay loop and simple mechanics. However, its simplicity, combined with the scarcity of resources and fragility of the character's mental and physical states is what makes this game so engaging. You're constantly making small decisions that have immediate ramifications that impact upcoming days. Since damn near everything in this game uses wood and parts of some kind, you can never have enough of them due to the character's limited inventory space when scavenging. 
This means that when you are scavenging, you can't just pick up whatever the fuck. You really got to mull over what you need to build certain stations. Do you take some food back to feed your people in the next couple of days or stock up on components? Take all the valuable trading items or prioritize medicine? Which leads to all the tough decisions you got to make back at the base with what tools and stations you need to make. Metal Workshop is usually automatic, but after that, you're often faced with situations like, do you create some beds now so your characters don't sleep like shit, or board up the house a bit now to prevent attacks? Create some shovels and other tools for deeper scavenging, or upgrade an existing station for more options and efficiency. And this same sort of design that incentivizes caution is also with the atrocities you commit in this game. One thing I really like here is that this game isn't that preachy about these acts being wrong. Instead, it speaks through its mechanics. You can steal and kill people for their shit, but all of that baggage during and after may not be what you want. You as the player may not feel bad about doing this, but it will definitely take a toll on your characters. They become depressed or worse, broken, where they don't respond to any of your commands. And even with the combat itself, your people are pretty fragile. It doesn't take a lot for a character to bite the dust. Most of the pre-made characters aren't fighters like that either. But even beyond the combat, sometimes neighbors will stop by and ask for help, and it's very easy to deny their request since you don't really have a lot to spare. However, almost always the people you help out come back later to reward you for your selflessness, quietly getting the point across that even in tough times, it's good to help those around you. What also makes this game pretty tough is its roguelike nature. You can't really go in with a perfect plan, and that's due to some zones just not being available and other zones being remixed. So like in one playthrough, the hotel would be filled with armed thugs that shoot first and ask later, while in another playthrough it's full of dudes that just want to trade. And yeah, it goes without saying, but this makes every playthrough feel fresh. For a roguelite though, this game is painfully slow at times. Lots of waiting around for characters to do things that you can't skip past for whatever reason. You can't skip a day, but sometimes you don't even want to do all that and you just want to fast forward through your current actions. Don't know why a simple fast forward option wasn't added. Seems like an easy implementation and I don't see how it would detract from anything. And since I'm on some negatives, I do wish that the controls were a bit better. Everything you do is on the mouse, and switching between characters and having multiple actions going at once can be a real pain in the dick. Other than the main game, there's the stories, where instead of random characters put together to survive, these are full-blown predetermined stories. Practically a story mode. You got this father trying to search for his sickly daughter, this crippled broadcaster and his wife trying to get the word out, and this orphan girl living out in the cold that runs into some strangers. Sorry to disappoint some people, but I don't really have much to say about these, really. They're cool if you need, like, a more straightforward, emotional narrative, but I personally like the more dynamic, create-your-own-narrative approach of the main game. Here, the game is made way more linear with the story taking precedence, and it becomes limiting to the point where I wasn't really having fun. So yeah, that's This War of Mine. One of the most clever anti-war games out. It's heavy with its themes and imagery and the gameplay is simple yet engaging. Even if you're not into games like this, I would still say give it a shot. There's not much else on the market like it and it's available on damn near everything at a low cost. Not to end on a downer note, but it's pretty sad that 10 years later, what goes on in this game is closer to people's realities now. Feel like we took the wrong lessons, y'all. Anyway, that's all I gotta say about this. If you like this video, do all the things to boost it in the algorithm. I got plenty of other reviews and retrospectives on the channel, so check those out if you have the time. Peace out, and until next time.